Coming up on Tech News today is Bioware caving on Mass Effect 3's ending. We talked to Brian Brushwood from Game On about that. The Great Spectrum Crunch is coming, and who is it going to crunch? The FCC and Congress are trying to figure that one out. And can man fly by flapping wings? All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, March 21st, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 30% off your new account for three months, go to Squarespace.com and use offer code TNT3. And by Ford, featuring Curve Control to help protect against crashes on curves. Look for Curve Control available in the 2013 Ford Taurus and learn more at Ford.com slash cars slash Taurus. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And we have got a show packed full of goodness. Joining us uh, from PC Perspective, PCPer.com, Mr. Ryan Shrout's back on the show. Welcome back, Ryan. Hello. How are you guys? We are doing well. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. You, you guys got a lot going on. It has it has been a busy winter. Uh, the the graphics card vendors have have kept the the PC hardware world turning uh, since basically January, and it doesn't help that it's unusual. It's like eighty five degrees here in Kentucky today, which is way above normal for uh, the middle of March. Wow, yeah, uh, it has been a mild, if not warm, winter in in large parts of the world. Uh, I yeah, think. Uh, we have a little tiny speck of uh, <laughs> video card news in the news views today. But then uh, when we get to the calendar, you can let us know some bigger news that's going to be breaking tomorrow. Let's start off with a uh, confirmation of a rumor we talked about on Monday. Uh, All Things D reporting uh, that Zynga did buy OMG Pop. In fact, it wasn't just All Things D. Zynga had a press conference and announced that they are buying OMG Pop. Peter Kafka at All Things D reports that sources told him the price was $180 million plus another $30 million or so in employee retention payments. This is, this is a big chunk of cash for something that has one hit. I mean, draw something's huge right now, but they really haven't had that kind of success with any of their other properties. Well, but okay, so they're buying, uh, this is obviously a game and a talent acquisition. Sure, they get about 40 people, right? Yeah, and I think OMG Pop has on their roster about 35 games, none of which are as huge as Draw Something, but it's not their only property. Um, what I think, uh, wh why I think this makes sense, and we talked about this just a couple days ago, you know, you know should Zynga buy uh, something like OMG Pop or are they just going to spin off a competitor that people just really won't, they, they won't care that they're ripping anything off and they'll just go with Zynga because Zynga's the bigger brand. But they're buying this in with a huge, huge user base. I mean, so many people are using Draw Something right now that I don't know if Zynga really even cares if this is still a phenomenon in a year. It's that they will now have these users in the, in the, the Zynga universe and can promote other Zynga properties to them. This is a great move for OMG Pop. I mean, like, who who knows how long their property is going to be hot? Who knows how long this is going to be? Oh, yeah, it's the top number. It's the number one top uh, free game and top not game free app and top uh, paid app. Mm -hmm. This is not something that I I expect them to be able to sustain if they went by themselves because Zynga would have probably crushed them if they didn't just take this money. I know there's some articles out there saying, well, Zynga, uh, uh, OMG Pop could have held out for more money. It's like, yeah. Probably not. No, the, the the timetable for this, these hits can just show up like over a weekend and then after a while they could just peter out. So who knows how long something like this is even sustainable. I also think that, uh, and Ryan Lawler over at GigaOM pointed this out too, is that uh, Draw Something is like the perfect game for the for the non gamer in the world, I mean, even even maybe more so than words with friends. I mean, it requires zero skill. It's almost like a little social network, really. Where I say to Aya, "Oh, let's you know," it's like a, it's it's for people who don't even necessarily like games. There's nothing gamey about it. So that's I think very very attractive to a company like Zynga because they don't need gamers. They want everybody. They want the people, all the millions of people who say, oh, "I don't really like games. I'm not really that kind of person." That's why they've had so much success on Facebook. This, this is this is the game that my wife plays. She played Words with Friends, and now she plays this. And, and I think you're exactly right. My, my issue was, was what Ayaz was saying, is you don't know how long this is going to last because she played Words with Friends 100 times a day for six months, and now all of a sudden that's over with. 
they've moved on. Uh, I think for, uh, for for OMG Pop here, it makes a ton of sense to get your money while you can because, like you say, you don't know if they're going to have anything else to follow up with this. And that you know what the other thing Zynga gets here we should mention is a is a New York office. Uh, the the forty people that are part of the uh, acquisition work in New York, so Zynga immediately has an office and a presence in New York that they didn't have before. That's good. Uh, they're also, according to Kafka, netting around two hundred fifty thousand dollars a day from draw something, which is a nice little chunk of change to be pumping into Zynga's bottom line. That's even after Apple takes its 30% cut. So uh, there, there is some value to draw something, no, no doubt about it. It's just whether it's sustainable or whether by next week people get tired of it and move on to something else. Uh, I want to bring in Brian Brushwood, host of Game On and Scam School now, because uh, we want to talk about Mass Effect 3 and, of course, Game On uh, constantly covering all this sort of stuff. But before we do move on to that, Brian, do you, you, you interviewed the guys from OMG Pop this weekend on Game On. Did you know they were going to yeah, be millionaires? As, as a matter of fact, they were super cool guys. And it was it's amazing to see what an overnight sensation and cultural phenomenon this has become. And in fact, you can check out the interview on the latest episode of Game On. Uh, I think this is a smart move for all the reasons you guys say, not the least of which is if they don't sell out to Zynga, Zynga's just going to pull a tiny tower on them and just crush them beneath their boot heel. So uh, for, for, for better or for worse, it's, it's a good move for the moment for OMG Pop. All right, let's move on to the uh, to the big Mass Effect 3 story. We mentioned uh, earlier last week, Casey Hudson, the executive producer, had gone online and uh, kind of made some mea culpa saying they were going to listen to fans. And today, BioWare co-founder and general manager Dr. Ray Muzika uh, waded in to the, to the furor, uh, saying that they were taking complaints about the conclusion seriously. Uh, they're crafting new content initiatives for the game, said he was genuine, genuinely surprised by the negative reactions, called the responses incredibly painful, Painful, said he's willing to accept the criticism and feedback with humility, said the development team is listening. And here's, here's the part that got people really excited. He said that executive producer Casey Hudson and the team are hard at work on a number of game content initiatives. I'm reading from his post that will help answer the questions, providing more clarity for those seeking further closure to their journey. You'll hear more on this in April. Brian, is he saying that they're going to change the ending? Well, the entire Twitterverse is acting as though that's what he's saying. And let's just say for sake of discussion, that is the case. If there's one thing more interesting than the fan backlash and the response to the backlash is the response to the response. Because just as loudly as everyone was saying, ah, the ending sucks, everything's ruined, this is worse than the prequels. Then the moment they say, how about we change it? They're all like, oh, cave in, just go ahead and just roll over. <laughs> that's a dangerous precedent for video games. Uh, and, and so and uh, I think that backlash was interesting. But he, here's the thing is, is gamers have a question that they need to answer to themselves. Do they want Bioware to become George Lucas where they obstinately refuse to change anything and they stand by their guns and they insist, no, it's an awesome ending. You're just too dumb to understand it. Or could it be that we just go ahead and change it? You know, gamers are a different group in that they're accustomed to they live in a mod culture. You know, if if Valve were to come out and say, oh, by the way, we now have a patch where at the end of Half-Life 2, Gordon Freeman could get the portal gun. Everyone would be like, this is the greatest thing ever. Valve's so awesome. They changed the ending of the game. But then meanwhile, this is an exact change people are begging for. And when Bioware says, well, maybe we'll make it so that you can have some more endings that you'd be interested in, then all of a sudden they're spineless jellyfish. So I think it's I suspect that they're making the right move. I, I don't think that being obstinate would play well for Bioware. And I suspect as, as surprised as everyone is at the about face, I think that people will realize this is no different than getting DLC for free that allows you more variability. Because if the complaint is you essentially only had three different endings, none of which really mattered or were substantially different from each other. Well, then how can you complain if all of a sudden you have 12 different endings that are substantially different from one another? Yeah. And he does say that they're going to provide more clarity, seek further closure. They're working hard to maintain the right balance between the artistic integrity of the original story while addressing the feedback. None of that says they're going to change anything. It just means they're going to add things. They correct. Say, that's correct. the now, way it reads to me. I suspect if they're smart, they will offer it as an add-on or as a patch that says, you know, and it might just be a line at the bottom of a patch that says uh, increased user fidelity options with, you know, in the end game of, of Mass Effect. And I'll tell you, here's the other thing that I think is very smart. This is a bad PR uh, cloud hanging over what otherwise is a revolutionary title and the end to a uh, genre-defining game. And for somebody like me who's like halfway 
through the game and I'm seeing the spoilers bleed out and I, I know pretty much the three different endings that are out there right now, it's so depressing that it's almost kept me from getting back into the game. But knowing that if I keep my slow turtles pace through the game, that somewhere a month or two from now, when I actually get to the end of the content, because there's a lot of content. If you do all the side quests, you're looking at 60 to hour, 60 to 80 hours of gameplay. Knowing that by the time we get to the end, there might be a more interesting w end waiting for me, I think is really important to rejuvenate interest in the franchise. All right. Well, thanks, Brian. We appreciate you uh, taking the time to chat with us. I know you guys will keep covering this on uh, Game On. Let folks know where they can find that show. Yeah, uh, we record live every Sunday night at live.twit.tv. Otherwise, look for uh, uh, twit.tv slash go, as in go, as in game on. And uh, if you want to see, we've got uh, fantastic interviews with the folks from OMG Pop in this last episode, along with Felicia Day. So make sure to check us out on both on YouTube and on iTunes. All right. Let's move on to the Spectrum Crunch story. We actually, uh, I, I put out a call on Twitter for some Spectrum Crunch graphics. We got, uh, we got this. <laughs> This one, thanks to Chad Dore, that's uh, FCC Chairman Jenikowski in the role of Captain Crunch. Also got this one from Woods, who gave it to us in the chat room. Uh, now with more spectrum. Now with more spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> Smart oh, choices I see it down made at the easy. bottom of the box. Yeah, there's well, the spectrum. That. That's uh, those are well done. So thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks to both those guys for for illustrating this segment. Uh, as Verizon went to Capitol Hill to face the Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Antitrust Competition Policy and Consumer Rights and their snappily titled committee meeting called the Verizon Cable Deals, Harmless Collaboration or a Threat to Competition dun, and Consumers. Dun, dun. Uh, this is referring to Verizon in December announcing a deal to pay $3.6 billion for unused airwaves from a consortium of cable companies. Uh, and, and it also treats with their uh, their deal with uh, Cox Communications to buy some spectrum from Cox directly. So that's you know close to four billion dollars worth of spectrum changing hands. That's a big deal. The FCC has to look at that and make sure it's in the interest of the country to uh, change hands into Verizon. Verizon's argument is there's not enough spectrum to go around. We're going to run out of spectrum in some major cities by the middle of 2013. We need the spectrum, and they're not using it. The cable companies aren't going to use it. However, U.S. Senator Herb Cole, speaking at the hearing today, urged regulators to ensure that these deals don't reverse the historic gains in competition between phone and cable companies over the past 15 years. He's worried about a truce because part of the deal has Verizon selling the cable company's television service and has the cable companies selling Verizon's telephone service. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of spectrum problems here. I mean, they, there there definitely is a, a scarcity of spectrum, but at the same time, do we want more concentration of spectrum in the hands of Verizon and AT&T? I mean, what's the alternative? Like T-Mobile's going to buy it or Sprint's going to buy it or another consortium could buy it, I guess, and that way maybe they can license it out. But the thing is, it looks like the FCC and base, the, the concepts right now is Nobody wants too much power in one in one particular group. AT and T, T Mobile would have been too large, according to the FCC. Same thing with with this case. If Verizon gets this the spectrum, maybe they are too powerful at that point, and then they have a lock. It's not like you can just uh, Verizon isn't exactly known for. Oh yeah, we'll license our spectrum to any any other person. You're going to have to use Verizon, or you have nothing. In certain they are areas. talking a little bit about wholesale, but certainly yeah, not license. Not the mm, level yeah. of, of of other competitors that we're, we're talking about. It's like the way Sprint is doing this and Clear is doing this. They're trying to really get into the wholesale uh, business, but. I mean, right? Spectrum Co. That that the cable companies that tried this, they failed. That's why they were they're selling this. They have a valuable asset, and somebody wants to pay them, and it just so happens to be Verizon because Verizon's making a ton of money. They they've got this game, and it's up to I guess the government to stop it if they want. I guess I hate to say, well, I can really see Verizon's side in this because I think it's a little silly for them to say this will this will just help competition and and prices might even go down because I don't really think either of those things are true. But when you hear Verizon saying things like, listen, we are going to have a spectrum problem. Uh, we've got a bunch of people who are getting onto LTE, for example. All these devices are moving over. People are consuming more data than ever. And, you know, by maybe this time next year, we're going to hit some sort of a roadblock. I would like Verizon to use it rather than nobody. Ryan, do you think that there's a real spectrum crisis that we're headed for? Do you think we'll... Uh I don't know. I mean, I don't follow that enough to, to know for sure if there's actually one. What concerns me most about this whole, uh, the deal is the trading of services, is the trading of, well, Verizon will offer uh, Comcast TV service and Comcast will offer 
uh, Verizon telephone service. And that, to me, is the exact opposite of brooding competition because you're essentially taking one player out of that game. Um, if it were just Spectrum being sold for one part or the other, I probably it wouldn't concern me at all I, because if it is being unused, I would appreciate it being back into some kind of market where it is being used. Um, but, you know, if... if if all of a sudden your 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 VoIP service to your cable company is now gone because it's all going through Verizon, you have one less competitor uh, to offer any kind of price competition there. And same way with going your TV services, if you are getting Cox or Comcast, whoever it was, through your Verizon service as well. It's these spectrum crunch stories that make me really curious about all those stories about when Wi-Fi can hand off much easier to wireless and back and forth. So you have this seamless integration. That's the thing where I'm like, I'm looking at this. This is a real problem, but you can't offload because there isn't more spectrum. But if they can handle the idea of moving your phone from a, from a Wi-Fi network over to 3G or 4G and then back seamlessly, then this thing can go away a bit. You can dissipate part of this problem by offloading it to these Wi-Fi zones, but that's why I'm really curious about what's going on over there in those technologies. Because if this is a finite quantity of a finite resource, you need alternate solutions. And if Wi-Fi is the other way to go, there needs to be more progress in that technology. I'm telling you, mesh, mesh networks where the spectrum is handled individually by mm -hmm. the devices, with a with a little bit of supplementing in rural areas where you don't have enough critical mass. That's the long-term solution to all of this because there's plenty of spectrum really to handle what we need it's the inefficient allocation and 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 management of it that's the uh, that's the issue a couple of addendums here in the interest of showing that there is some competition the fcc is uh con considering two proposals or or at least putting a couple of proposals out on the table uh dish networks wants to start using the two gigahertz satellite spectrum for terrestrial cellular service and that's off to a strong start. It seems that uh, the FCC have made an initial push to get behind that conversion, which would move the spectrum from mobile satellite service to advanced wireless service. Sound familiar, Light Squared? And FCC has started to move on a longstanding effort to require some manner of 700 megahertz interoperability. The problem there is that Verizon, AT&T, and a lot of other smaller operators own chunks of the 700 megahertz spectrum. But the, the devices being made only use certain parts of the 700 megahertz spectrum. So if you own one of the chunks that Verizon isn't making their devices to work with, your chunk is essentially worthless. So the FCC is coming in saying, look, we need to make sure that if you're using the 700 megahertz spectrum, that it works, uh, the device works on any part of that spectrum. What's the incentive to, to be limiting that part of the 700 spectrum? A megahertz spectrum that on may, the device side. It's it's the incentive that says when you buy that device, you can only use it with us. Uh -huh. You can't go unlock it and take it to somebody else. Well, that's not very nice. No, it's that sounds not. like selfish behavior to it me. It is unkind. not consumer friendly. Right. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, take a break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. Folks, you know all about Squarespace. We tell you about it all the time. So I'm just going to remind you that if you want a great looking site, if you want reliable service, you want, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of servers at your beck and call to power your site at any time. You want that reliability and you want those high quality designs to choose from to make your site look good. Go check it out. Squarespace.com. You don't need a credit card to try it out. You don't need anything but a web browser and Square, the, the URL, squarespace.com. You can start a website right now. See if you like it. Even import your current blog to see what it looks like in their templates. And if you do like it, keep the service with our compliments and have a little discount. Uh, use the offer code TNT3 and receive 30% off for three months. That's squarespace.com. No reason not to try it. Go, go give it a shot. Squarespace.com. Use that offer code TNT3. Uh, if you've been putting it off or you've been thinking, oh, I'd like to start a site, do it right now. TNT3, 30% off. Squarespace.com. We thank you for your support of Tech News Today. All right, there's a uh, video going around uh, that is causing quite a bit of controversy. Jarno Smeets, a.k.a. the human bird wings guy, takes his self-built flapping wings on a flight, claiming that he's using Wii controllers hooked up to some Android-based devices to fly with bird wings. You know, people people have been flying for over a century now, but not the way birds do. So let's take a little look at this video. And apologies to the audio listeners. Uh, go to the show notes. Check it out. If you just search for human bird wings, you're going to find the video somewhere. And, and watch along with us. Uh, because he's actually flapping his wings, running, getting some lift, and he goes flying. Now, there's an inset video that uses a GoPro camera to show his perspective. That's one of the controversies here is they're saying that GoPro perspective is too steady. If he's up there flapping his wings around, I mean, and again, he's using motion controllers. He's using Wii. They think that head bob 
should be seen more in the GoPro version, that that looks like it might be on a stick, that it might be a little too steady. Uh, other people have said, you know what, if he's got enough headwind, he could just glide with a regular glider. He wouldn't need to do the flapping. The flapping might be immaterial. But everybody's getting in on the criticism of this uh, video. Jamie Heineman of uh, Mythbusters laid out an explanation of how it could be plausible that this would work using modern tech. Uh, he says the video of, of John O'Sweets is cool, and I don't see evidence that it was faked. It seems reasonable to accomplish and is something I've wanted to try for a long time, but I'm suspicious that there is not much detail shown of the actual machine. But that does not mean anything other than they don't show it all. He also says the flight is not as impressive as it may seem, given a bit of headwind and a very slight incline. Running and gliding close to that heightened distance might be possible anyway without flapping our motors. Uh, Gizmodo talked with Ryan Martin, the technical director at Industrial Light and Magic, who is firmly of the mind that Smeet's flight did not fall within the realm of the possible, <laughs> went around the studios at ILM, and, and, and most people brought up that, you know, his head isn't moving part, but a lot of people were skeptical. And Rhett Elaine, an associate professor of physics at Southeastern Louisiana University, analyzed the background images for Wired and found no evidence of faking. He says, you know, when you look, when you look at the background images, when you analyze this video and look for the fingerprints of green screen or, or modification, you don't find it. Everything looks like it probably was filmed as it happened. This is also, it's such a weird thing to fake because it's not like, you know, he flies to the next county or anything. I mean, he gets up for a couple of minutes and then he glides back down. Looks really cool, but yeah, I have... I, I also am not sure if the whole uh, camera mounted on the head not bouncing enough makes that much sense to me because those are always how the POV cameras end up looking. You know, when, mm -hmm. when you've got it as part of your body, it seems... But if you're flapping, you know... But you that. saw him. I mean, his, you know, his he's not flapping with his head. Right. I, yeah, I think... And you, you are know, seeing a little bit of that movement. A little bit, You're seeing yeah. some movement. It's not perfectly still. I so. just... That doesn't jump out at me as why it would be fake. I, it, it seemed to be moving in accordance with how the rest of his body was it would, moving. It would be interesting to compare the, the slight movement that you do see in the superimposed helmet cam and slow it down and time it with the actual wings flapping on y y the image of the, the, whatever, the bird itself and see if they match up through the entirety of it. You know what I mean? And I'm sure some of I'm these sure doing that right now. are doing that, yeah. but... That would be telling. Because to be able to fake that that precisely would be difficult, I would think. I want this to be true. I, I, yeah, like I've seen, there's yeah. so many hoaxes, th things that turn out to be hoaxes. I'm like, oh, you can run on water. No, you can't run on water. These are, this is an ad for shoes. Oh, you can flap your wings and do this. What, what is this an ad for at the end of the day? Is it for GoPro? Is it for some, uh, some CG company that's really good? It's like, look, you couldn't even detect our great work. I mean, I don't know what the end of this is going to be, but like, I wish it was true. And, and but it's like a bad, it's like a bad commercial for GoPro. If that's what that was, it's not very highly. You know? yeah, right. featured, it's like, yeah, it's like right. you don't see anything cool. You just see we some all just grass. see GoPro though. We're not saying the other company. Contour makes their own cameras, and nobody's calling it that. Yeah, that's true. Ryan, I, what do you uh, first, think? I, I've learned never to doubt MythBusters first. So hopefully they'll do this. And also, it's like if 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 whoever made this video, if you want to. Prove that it's not a fake. Make another video. Post it on YouTube. How much longer could that take? A couple of hours to show the mechanics and the hardware behind it? Mm. That's what gets me. That's what makes me believe that it is a hoax if there's no mm. kind of rebuttal and answer from the people on that side. Use your cell phone camera and, and go through the garage where you got all this equipment and show everybody and describe what you're doing. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't have to give away your, your, your intellectual property secrets if there's something in there. But tell people that you're not lying because now everybody thinks you are. Yeah, I mean, he can prove that it's true, yeah. uh, but if he doesn't reply, that doesn't mean it's fake. And that, no. that, you know, that could be part of it. He may just be, you know, a prankster who's like, I, I just want people to, I want people to talk about it. I want people to wonder. But yeah, I, as you, you pointed this oh, out. Oh, you want me? Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll do the rain of the parade thing. I, I, I have a science degree, so the thing I always think of, if this is, if this is true, you can repeat the results all the time. That's how this works. Like every time we see those, those reports of, oh, there's a perpetual motion machine. Yeah, try to prove it again. It doesn't work the second time. If, That's what Ryan's if, saying. Yeah, you can do this. If like if this guy really wants to be famous based on this, I guess he could do it again. But I mean, he already is famous based on flapping his wings and being show on your wings, prove it. <laughs> show us your wings. <laughs> it's weird. It used to be the whole thing was pics or, or we don't believe you or, or, or it didn't happen. Pics or didn't happen. Now we have video. And we're like, didn't happen. Still didn't happen. I still, I, I want to believe.
<laughs> All right, I don't want to believe that uh, the MPAA is going to start suing fans again, but... Well, we'll see about this. Wired's reporting that the MPAA is mulling a massive copyright litigation campaign against individual users of Mega Upload. You know, the MPAA kind of got Mega Upload taken offline. Uh, Wired published part of a letter sent from the MPAA's attorney to Mega Upload, uh, the Mega Upload host Carpathia, on January 31st, demanding the host preserve all material related to Mega Upload, including all data associated with content files and user data, which, of course, has everybody freaked out. Because if you use Mega Upload, maybe the MPAA is coming after you. But... The MPAA vice president, Howard Gantman, said in a telephone interview the studios are not intending on suing individual users, but are considering suing Mega Upload or entities involved in the massive what's this, in the massive copyright infringement. So, uh, so if, if they found somebody who had uploaded quite a mm -hmm. lot of files on Mega Upload, they'd go after them. Yeah, like or an organization or somebody that, okay, look, we have a huge system uploading uh, things over to Mega Upload. Maybe they'd go after them. But of course, again, it's, it doesn't foreclose the possibility that individual, individuals will get sued. Now, when I looked at this, my, my first thought was that uh, this was a way for the MPAA to make sure that these drives didn't get destroyed in case they need them later on in the case. And this was, this was a plausible way to get the court to preserve them uh, because they could say, well, we might pursue a civil suit, whether they mean to or not. It just keep the, they've been very concerned with keeping that data from, from being destroyed or being put down. The government does have its own copies, right? Because they, they seize the servers, they copy the, the data. The government does, but the MPAA right. does The other thing is, like, to say that they have an ulterior motive instead of suing individuals, that's like, well, of course, I mean, they, the suing the individual thing sounds really believable to Poor me. Poor Carpathia, though. I mean, think of that. Ryan, they, they're spending $9,000 a day to keep 25 petabytes of data around that they're not getting paid for. Yeah, that seems like uh, if these lawyers want that data, they should be at least footing that bill at the very least, right? Um, it, it, it seems fishy to me that, you know, we're, we'll promise we're not going to sue the end users, but please keep all the end users' information around. Yeah. Well, you want to keep all the information around. All of it. Just could, 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 could Carpathia anonymize all the information, yeah. though? You know, and just go after the administrators of the site like they're, like they're claiming to want to do, so. Yeah, and uh, Cindy Cohn from the EFF, you know, points out that people shouldn't feel relieved about being sued, that, you know, <laughs> okay, the there, option's still open. And there's currently a scam going on. Uh, Torn Freak reported it. Uh, some a fake law firm out there calling itself Dr. Croner and Collagen is sending out uh, letters with a bunch of fake IP addresses saying, hey, you, you're part of the mega upload thing. We represent EMI, Sony, Universal, Paramount, and uh, you can be subject, subject to a fine of up to 10,000 euros, but... You can settle right now for 147 euros. Yeah, so don't fall for the phishing scam. So yes. legitimate. This Dr. is just Croner the latest and one. and Collagen wants 147 euros from me. <laughs> sure just it does. say no. Yeah. <laughs> On to uh, a, an unlikely partnership, sort of. Uh, one that's got a lot of people in the social network photo sharing space excited. Yeah. There, actually, a lot of uh, people get these two apps mixed up, but they're very different. I'm talking about Hipstamatic and Instagram, who have decided to team up using Instagram's API to um, have a formal partnership. The partnership will allow any pictures that a, a Hipstamatic user, Hipstamatic is an iOS-only app, as is Instagram, at least for now. Instagram uh, is working on an Android app, but it's not live yet. Take a picture on Hipstamatic. You can then send it to Instagram the way that you have in the past been able to also post to Twitter, Facebook, Flickr, or Tumblr. So Instagram is just one of your many options. What happens then is the picture um, is cropped to Instagram's famous little square style, and uh, you can add a comment uh, within Hipstamatic. And then once it's posted on Instagram, your photo, along with whatever comment you, you know, or, or caption that you added to it, will say, taken with Hipstamatic within Instagram. Now, if Tom looks at my photo and he has Hipstamatic and he clicks that little that little URL, he will be taken back to my Hipstamatic permalink. If he doesn't have the app, he will be taken to the App Store where he has the option to buy Hipstamatic for $1.99. So... On Hipstamatic side, this is a great, a money great maker. partnership. They're going to uh, they're going to sell a lot of 
a, um, a lot of uh, a lot of apps, <laughs> a lot of the or, uh, instances of the Hipstamatic app. So, what does it mean for Instagram? Why would they want this? Because Hipstamatic is doing really well. Um, they claim to have about four million users. 48 million uploads per month. Um, they have some kind of cool partnerships with big brands like Nike and Vogue that have custom lenses, which are add-ons, um, stuff that you can buy in-app purchases, basically, um, to give yourself more filters and things like that. Uh, the New York Times, uh, Damon Winter, a photographer, won a Pictures of the Year International Prize using Hipstamatic. So they've got a lot of buzz. Instagram, though, has 27 million users as of last week, which is triple the user base they had just six months ago. So, I mean, their usership is skyrocketing. They don't really need Hipstamatic's 4 million users, but what they do want to be is a social network. Mm. Instagram is a great little social network if you want to use Instagram, but it's not the it's not the place where you can dump in photos from all sorts of other places, almost the way that you would think of as Flickr, and they want to be that. So they're trying this out with Hipstamatic. This is my opinion anyway. Trying this out with Hipstamatic, so it's like... You've already got this other app that is based on taking pictures that might be kind of mediocre, then adding a lot of different filters. You could call them hipster filters, but retro filters or whatever, but there's a variety of filters. They're not exactly the same as Instagram. And then using Instagram as the place where everybody goes to talk about it and then to further share. So I think this is really smart on Instagram's part. Kevin Systrom, a CEO of Instagram, said, listen, we don't have any other partnerships to uh, disclose at this point, but it's kind of like, hey, if this works out well, they could see this working with an app like Camera Plus, for example, extremely popular in the App Store, or Camera Awesome, or uh, taking you know photos just with, with your camera um, app in iOS. So the possibilities are endless. What is, what is Instagram? I mean, other than your explanation, which is a good one, that, that they get to test out a partnership, they're really not going to benefit from Hipstamatic, though. It's not going to give them users. They're not getting a rev share. They're not. They're not getting a chunk of change from Hipstamatic for sending all these users. This is all to Hipstamatic's benefit. Well, you could think of it that way. In in the short term, it is totally to Hipstamatic's benefit. However, it's 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 changing uh, the way that people are using Instagram because right now I have to take a picture in a different app, then I got to save it to my camera roll, then I got to import from my camera roll into Instagram. It's possible to do, but lots of people don't do that because it's way too much work. If Instagram has a one button, hey, let's share on Instagram type of a thing, then they replace possibly Facebook. The way that everyone uploads photos to Facebook, not necessarily because it's the best way to save your photos, but that's just where everybody does it. It's easy to share. It's easy to comment. It's easy to, um, you know, to end up posting on a wall. I see Instagram trying to go in that direction for photos. So with Instagram, though, if they if they let their API out and everybody can use it and they start having millions and millions and millions of more users, I mean, they need to make money on what? The API calls, maybe putting ads on Instagram? Because I haven't seen ads on this thing yet. So is, is where would they be going? Because I think, how does Twitter work? Well, they had millions of users. They go, well, we'll promote these and we'll have these ads here. Do you think that's where they're going? Well, I don't know if it's going to be ad-based. I think that Hipstamatic, for example, and also um, another service that lets you share photos, Path, have really uh, have good revenue streams where they give you a variety of filters for free, but then you can uh -huh. you, you can buy extra filters for 99 cents a pop. They make a lot of money doing that. Instagram could easily make a lot of money just adding a couple special filters for the people who feel like the 20 ones that they give you for free aren't enough. Um, or maybe adding, you see a lot of third-party apps and services services that use the Instagram API to make uh, magnets, you know, that people can buy or photo books, that sort of thing. Instagram hasn't gotten into that game at all, but I bet they will. All right, let's move on to the news fuse. And finally, a story for PC Perspective. AMD has unleashed the open source drivers for the Radeon HD 7000 GPU and the Fusion Trinity APUs for Linux. The hope is that these drivers will find their way into the Linux kernel code, which could mean being able to install AMD graphic cards much easier. Before we move on, Ryan, significance of this story? Um, it, it's fairly significant because NVIDIA is kind of still pretty far behind in what driver software they actually enable in uh, in, in Linux. Um, so AMD AMD's always been kind of on the forefront of, of enabling the open source community, and this kind of just solidifies that they're 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 probably the best partner for that market. Cool. On to Google Chrome. That's you, Sarah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Google Chrome was the world's most popular PC browser, beating out IE, according to Stat Counter. I say was because it lasted only for one day, March 18th. Chrome's gain was definitely at the expense of IE as well as other browser numbers uh, because the other browser numbers didn't really budge. Google gained users in a few specific places, Brazil, India, Russia. The Chrome reign was short-lived, though, just the one day, March 18th, because IE is now back on top. The Wall Street Journal wrote a piece about the new iPad using LTE, and they declared it a speed trap. The LTE connection on the tablet is robust enough to handle video streams, but users can hit their data cap within a few hours. Something's got to give. Either subscribers pay up or subscribers start pushing around those carriers say, hey, more data for less money. At the Samsung foreign event in Beijing, Samsung Greater China President Kim Young-ha said that the Galaxy S3 release date might get pushed up to increase sales. TechCrunch says that the device looked to be released in May, so we might see it in March. In more Samsung news, the Korea Times reported that Samsung will rely less on Qualcomm for its chips and instead use its own in-house single chips. Bloomberg reports that Google's looking into ways to make Google Wallet more popular with wireless carriers. Google may start giving a cut of its revenue with AT&T and Verizon to get the two largest U.S. carriers to back Google's mobile payment system. Sprint is the only carrier supporting Google Wallet at least right now. The Associated Press reports the tale of a job-hunting New Yorker whose prospective employer asked for his Facebook username and password because his profile was marked private. The applicant withdrew, this, uh, withdrew his application from consideration, but apparently this kind of thing is common among public agencies like police departments. While not illegal, the practice does violate Facebook's terms of service, though. Apple's monstrous presence in the mobile space may make it the world's number one mobile processor company by the end of 2012, according to Instat, anyway. Last year, Intel was on top with 181 million processors shipped, and Apple moved 176 million processors. Instat bases its 2012 predictions on Apple's spectacular sales numbers so far for the iPad and iPhone. You know who's not going to be buying those Apple products, though? Me. Well, I already bought them. <laughs> yeah, I didn't no. buy the iPhone. I, no, I did buy the not iPhone. you, Tom, yeah. because it's I'm not going to buy them again. But you don't work at Microsoft, so maybe I that's don't. the reason. Mary Jo Foley published what appears to be an internal Microsoft email, which outlines a new policy that says Apple products should not be purchased with company funds. Mary Jo tried to get confirmation whether the email was real or not, but Microsoft gave her no comment. I really don't think it's that crazy to think that Microsoft would say, can you please stop buying iPads with our company phones? Well, yeah, I mean, it's not like they're stopping the employees from getting it personally. Yeah, you do what you want in your own time to stop bringing your iPad to work. And right. then, do you think it's crazy, And Ryan? then sending an expense report. No, I think that happens in pretty much every corporation where they will, uh, let's say, highly encourage you to buy uh, a product from your own company, right? So if you're at NVIDIA, you can't have a notebook with an AMD graphics in it. You can't buy a, 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 a laptop with an AMD processor and that kind of stuff. Hopefully it doesn't I think it's pretty comp. Hopefully it doesn't apply to the Mac business unit. They kind of need those products, I think. <laughs> yeah. According to analytics firm Flurry, China is now the world leader in Android and iOS device activation. Flurry tracked more than 1 billion aggregated application sessions per day. Now, China passed the United States in iOS and Android activation in February with 23% of the world's activations. All right, so let's uh, take a break and thank our sponsor, Ford.com. Uh, for, uh, well, not, they're, they're kind of a dot com. I said that by accident, but uh, they, are, they are putting so much tech in their cars these days that I kind of think of them that way. This episode brought to you by Ford featuring Curve Control. We've been talking about that lately. Curve Control is part of a suite of safety technologies on the 2013 Ford Taurus. It helps drivers maintain control of their vehicle when taking a curve too quickly. So here's how it works. If you're thinking like, well, I don't want the you know wheel ripped out of my hands. It's not like that. Uh, what happens is it looks for potential problems. And so it measures how quickly the vehicle is turning, how quickly the driver is trying to turn the wheel, roll rate, yaw rate, lateral acceleration, wheel speed, steering angle. All these calculations are run 100 times every second. And when it finds a problem, it doesn't have to be a big problem like you're running off the road. Curve control reduces engine torque applies four-wheel braking, slows the vehicle. It can go up to 10 miles per hour in one second, but it doesn't need to. And it works on dry or wet pavement. So you might not even know what's happening. It's just keeping your curve safe while you make those turns on the highway. Uh, curve control helps protect while driving on curves. And it's one of the several new driver assist technologies available on the 2013 Ford Taurus. You can learn more about it, more about curve control and all these other technologies at ford.com slash cars slash Taurus. And we thank Ford for their support of Tech News Today. On to the calendar. Rovio has a little gift for all of you who need more Angry Birds. Angry Birds Space is launching tomorrow. Birds, 
in space. I wanted to do that for so long. Um, and also, tip from Ryan Shroud. Actually, there's a new enthusiast graphic card from India. <laughs> NVIDIA, NVIDIA. NVIDIA. Not India. Ooh. NVIDIA. Uh, tomorrow that you are going to talk about a little bit more at noon Eastern 9 Pacific on PC Perspective. Tell us more. Uh, so, yeah. So, NVIDIA, it, there's been a lot of rumors going around. It's no surprise they're going to launch a new graphics card tomorrow to finally compete against AMD 7000 series. Uh, and we are going to be uh, trying something new. We're going to be doing like a live review where essentially uh, we, we talk about the review. We demo the product live as well at uh, and, and we're actually going to have a representative from NVIDIA on hand, too, to answer questions from uh, listeners and chatters and people who send tweets and that kind of stuff as well. So you can find all that uh, tomorrow. We'll start at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific at PCPer.com slash live. That's kind of cool. I like this idea of, you know, sort of celebrating the release of the NDA, so to speak, by saying, OK, now we can tell you everything and we're going to tell you live. Here you go. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it, that's a cool idea. Yeah, it's it's one of the things we we always get. You know, we we publish a review. I work on a review. I'm I'm working on it today, uh, and we publish it, and we get lots of you know readers. And but there's everybody always has questions. They're emailing questions. They're posting comments on the article. And this uh, oh. live, inter, oh, sorry, be inter, but be able to interact live with them uh, right on the spot uh, when when the NDA is up, and so they can ask questions if if it wasn't answered in the story. And uh, we'll have somebody from Nvidia on hand as well to help answer questions too. Cool. We just had a dramatic pause from your Skype feed there for a second. I, you heard <laughs> I love those. Those are, those are my favorite. Yeah. All right, let's check what's incoming. Incoming message. Uh, we were talking yesterday uh, about the BBC iPlayer app showing up on the Xbox, and we were uh, discussing the ins and outs of the BBC television licensing system, how the BBC is funded. And thankfully, we got a good call here that sort of explains the ins and outs of who has to pay the license fee and why. Good afternoon, TNT. This is Welsh D from Glasgow. Uh, there are two things that are absolutely fantastic about living in the UK. Well, maybe there's more than two, but there are two really big ones. One, socialised healthcare, and two, the great British Broadcasting Corporation. The TV licence, or TV and radio licence, as it actually is, uh, fundamentally pays for a good chunk of the programme that goes out of the BBC and the maintenance of the transmitter infrastructure and whatnot and so forth. Now, the actual reason you need the licence is to receive television broadcasts in real time, as in the point that they are broadcast. So, to answer the question of iPlayer on an Xbox with a monitor, technically, if you're using it to catch up with shows that were on yesterday, it's license exempt. If you're using it to watch shows as they're being broadcast now, officially you need the licence. Uh, problem is, is there's a bit of a hoo-ha at the moment. Someone's saying, actually, I've got a three-second delay, and it's not live. TV license people say that you do need, and fundamentally, they're the folks in charge. Uh, but, under UK law, they have no right to gain access to your property without your permission. So, even though they may have a van and a little machine that says, oh, I can see your television set, they can't actually come in to prove it. It's a bit of an interesting one in the UK. There are many, many, many people who do not pay their approximate $15 a month for a TV license and watch TV anyway. Well, there are many people like myself who do not pay their approximate $15 a month for their TV license and don't watch TV at all. I'm a cord cutter. The majority of my mainstream media comes from uh, you fellows, actually. Distressing, eh? Love you all. Bye. Distressing. <laughs> not distressing for us, yeah. but uh, appreciate that, that explanation of the ins and outs. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we hope we got everything uh, correct. If, if there's minor corrections, let us know, TNT at twit.tv. But from what we can tell, everything you said sounds on the up and up. So thank you for the call. Appreciate that. Andrew wrote in to TNT at uh, twit.tv, said, I just finished watching episode 461. You talk about HP's printing segment not having done anything innovative in years. Although this is mostly true with HP, they did innovate with a product called MagCloud you may not have heard of. No, I haven't. It lets <laughs> anyone create a physical magazine and allows customers to buy a physical copy, which they print and send on demand. Quite disruptive, even if print is dying. Anybody hear of this? I looked Before? it up. It's at madcloud.com. It exists. It's real. There Still it around. Wow, why, that's innovation. Why? Why would I want to buy a magazine to to print on my really expensive HP ink? I, I know, right? This is a great deal for HP because they get to sell you more <laughs> ink cartridges. Yeah, I don't know. I'm confused. But it has saddle stitch binding. Yeah. I, oh, I, that I, does it. That's perfect. Then I love it. Yeah. It's like a once in a while novelty this is cool thing. Yeah, that's why it's that's why it hasn't caught on. But <laughs> I, I I will say and you know to Andrew uh, that is an example of innovation, maybe not one that is going to catch on or has caught on, but but it is something different and it looks like it's 
pretty interesting stuff. If you want to print books, maybe mementos for the family or something mm-hmm. like that. Instagram photo albums, yeah, for example. Yeah, exactly. That's the next. No, I'm just kidding. That's like the return That's of the, the next partnership. The return of the fanzine. You remember those old <laughs> things? Yes. I used to do one. I used to do one too. Well, you guys are so cool. What about you, Sarah? <laughs> I didn't, uh-huh. but I did uh, get an email from Stuart that I will read now. Tom, Sarah, Ayaz, Jason, and since you mentioned him yesterday, Terpster. Although I'm from the northern and say better, and some say better part of Britain, Scotland, I now live in Calgary, but I still follow UK tech stuff. I wasn't so good it kept you, huh? I thought you might be interested in a Kickstarter type company that does operate in the UK because Kickstarter does not. It's called Crowdfunder. Crowdfunder.co.uk seems to operate much the way that Kickstarter does. And I did just invest in a friend's project on there uh, where he met his target and is very happy about the service. Thanks, and thanks for the hours of entertainment you guys provide. Oh, you're welcome, Stuart. Yeah. And uh, g- good to know about these different uh, Kickstarter-like companies uh, that are overseas. What was the Rocket one? That Rocket we- Hub. Rocket Hub uh, was another one. So good stuff. This is why I love our audience, because they are all smarter than we could ever possibly be in collective. Hive mind. Yeah, the hive mind Zzz. is awesome. Zzz. All right, that's it for this issue of Tech News Today that you've printed out. The fanzine. On your HP Tech News fanzine Today. printer. <laughs> <laughs> Flipbook format. Uh, you can submit stories to us at technewstoday.reddit.com. That's our subreddit where you can vote things up or down. Get in there and vote, even if you don't have time to submit the stories. Let us know what stuff you'd like to hear us talk about on the show. Ryan Shrout, great to have you on. I'm sorry we didn't have more hardware news. We'll have to have you back. On a, on a beefier day. Problem is, when the hardware news all breaks, then you get busy because you got to do PC perspective. Yeah, we'll, we'll, make, we'll make it work soon. There, there will be, uh, between now and, say, the end of April, a lot of hardware news to discuss. Excellent. So. Looking forward to it. And uh, let folks know again where to find all your stuff. So PCPer.com is where we publish all of our reviews and news and that kind of stuff. We'll actually record uh, the podcast here on the on the Twit Network uh, tonight, actually, at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern. And then I'm on This Week in Computer Hardware with Patrick Norton, also on the Twit Network, and that records Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern. And then also check out, uh, if you're interested in the new NVIDIA graphics card released tomorrow, check out pcpro.com slash live. Thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, and give us a call. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Nate Langson from wired.co.uk joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.